Okay, uh, so thanks everyone for coming to the talk. This talk is about the Elixir programming language. And to me, this is a very interesting talk to give because um, I think uh, today we have a very clear objective for the language and what the language is about, but it was not always like that. So it's really nice to look uh, what we've did in the last years and say like, okay, I, I see this is what uh, it is about and that's what I want to show this talk. And I have to have this slide, uh, Francesco kind of spoiled it, but it's not about the syntax. So Elixir was never created as a syntax reaction. Uh, to me, it would be not enough reason, for example, to create a programming language. You need to have more than that and try to offer other things. And that said, okay, the way I, so in order to explain uh, what Elixir is about, I want to go to how I see how the Erlang code works or code that is, uh, runs on the Erlang virtual machine and the Erlang runtime, uh, how I consider it and how I see it, okay? So uh, when we are writing code uh, for the Erlang virtual machine, there are really three things here. Uh, there are the, the data types, so integers, tuples, lists, and uh, we have modules, and modules is where we actually have our behavior, our code, okay? And then we have this other thing called processes, which kind of ties everything together. So uh, the processes, they contain most of the data types, right? So when you have an integer, when you have a list, it belongs to a process. And a process is running a code defined by a module. And after we have all those things, right, we want to, we, are, we heard a lot about tooling this morning, right? So we want to package all of that in a very nice tooling. And uh, when I look at this now, uh, the way I consider it is that we have, for those three things, there are two that are very well developed, right? And, uh, and two others that they could be improved and they could uh, be better citizens, right, in this runtime and on the language as a whole. So uh, processes, they are clearly the main attraction of the show, right? Uh, that's our abstraction for uh, concurrency, our abstraction for distribution. We have great tools for introspecting, monitoring processes. It's excellent, right? Superb. And then we have modules that they are very expressive tools where we write our code. We have, um, for, we have other great things associated to modules. For example, it's our abstraction for doing things like hot code swapping. But when we look at data types, uh, they were really not as well developed with time as everything else. I think a very good example of that is uh, how long it took for us to get a very good support for an associate associative uh, data structure like maps. They are here. Uh, I'm really glad that they are here. It's, uh, they are fantastic. Um, but it took a while. And it kind of shows that you know this part kind of like always uh, were a little bit behind, lagging a little bit behind, and there are more evidences uh, of this, right? So, for example, we still have no custom data type, okay? Uh, records aim to add tag tuples uh, to the language, but uh, we have thousands of discussions about this. The implementation kind of backfired. Uh, um, the community is kind of has a love and hate relationship with records. records. Um, to me, maps are improvement uh, in, when compared to, to records, but they do not officialize tagging. And what I mean by that is that there is, so records, one of the main issues is that they are compile time, right? They're just at compile time. There's very little you can do with it at uh, runtime, run time because everything gets compiled away. And maps, they are runtime only. So there isn't a way for me to say, hey, I have this map of this type. And if I try to match this map uh, with some particular field that doesn't really belong to it, I would like to have errors also at compile time if I tag it. Okay, so we don't have this idea of tagging. Uh, the Richard O'Keefe proposal for frames before we had maps, they, it actually talked a little bit about tagging. So we don't have this yet. Uh, another evidence about uh, how we could Im improve our uh, data type support in general, there is a paper from Philip Wadler uh, from 88, okay, where he's saying, you know, uh, we need to make ad hoc polymorphism. We are going to talk about this. Ad hoc polymorphism is the main form of polymorphism we have in Erlang. We need to make it less ad hoc. And he goes into detail why uh, other uh, forms of polymorphism are important and what we gain uh, with expressiveness on that. And another example, okay, and uh, this is just 
to tease a little bit, is actually some Java 8 code, okay? And Java 8, uh, they added lambdas finally to Java. And um, with uh, lambdas, they added all this uh, functional vocabulary that we are familiar with. Okay, so I, now I can filter a collection, I can map, I can reduce. And uh, this is something very interesting. It was actually one of the first things I missed when I came to Erlang, is that Erlang has no idea of collections. Yes, we have lists, we have sets, we have uh, dictionaries, but there is no API where I can work with those things as collections. Okay, so for example, in this Java 8 code, I have a widget with a collection. I don't really care if it's an array, an, an array uh, a set, I don't care about it, okay? And I can filter it, so I have widgets, I can filter getting widgets uh, with the color red, and then I can map it, getting their weight, and then I can sum the result, okay? So to me, this was a very big deal. I wanted to have a way to express things as collections. And one of the big benefits we come from this is that I don't need to learn new APIs every time I'm going to work with a different uh, data set, even more if I'm uh, treating it as a collection. I can have a filter function that works with a huge variety of data types. And, uh, and not only that, right? Uh, we see a lot of functional, what we see a lot of functional programming languages doing is that they do not only have the idea of collections, but they also bring the idea of laziness, right, when working with collections. So if we go back to the previous code, what is going to happen here is that if I have widgets and then I filter them, I'm going to traverse the whole collection and filter them. And then if I want to map, I'm going to traverse the whole collection again, mapping and getting some value. And then I'm going to sum, which is going to get this latest traversal and sum, traverse everything again and get the final result. If this is, even more if we're talking about a functional language that is immutable, uh, if we have a large collection here, it means we're going to generate a bunch of garbage, right? Because we're going to traverse the widgets once, right? And then we are going to tra traverse it again and then traverse it again. Uh, and it can be expensive in terms of uh, memory many times. The whole idea of laziness, what we can do is that we can say, hey, I have this uh, widgets stream. And what the stream says is that all the computations we call from then on, it's like a recipe. It's going to be stored. So we say widgets.stream. And when we call filter, we are not going to traverse the whole collection at that moment. We just store that computation. When we call map, the same thing. We're not going to traverse that. We're just going to store it. And finally, when we call sum, we kind of fold all those recipes, right? all those computations together and then we are going to do it just once because sum is going to realize a final value, which is an integer. Okay, with this in mind, right? So what is Elixir about? What, what Elixir uh, brings to the table? You probably have an idea, right, from those first slides. And every time I'm talking about Elixir, I like to talk about it uh, through the language goals perspective, okay? So we have three goals uh, as a language. We have the goal of extensibility, Productivity and compatibility. And the rest of the talk is exactly going through those goals and giving examples of what we are doing to uh, express them. So let's start with extensibility. And the point I want to make about extensibility here is uh, exactly about polymorphism. And I'm going to call it data type polymorphism. It's not the correct name for it. But I'm calling it because I hope it's going to be very clear what we, we are aiming with uh, such kind of polymorphism, OK? So if we go back to the previous slide, right, uh, to the, the second slide of the talk, when we're saying about data types, modules, and processes, it happens that modules and processes, they are polymorphic in their way. Okay, so for example, we write code like this. I want to send a message to this process, okay, represented by this PID. And when we write code like this, what we are saying is that I don't really care what is that process. I don't care which, uh, what is its state. I don't care which module code it's running. All we care about is that that process know how to handle that particular message. So we can write a code that says, hey, I want to send this message to any process that handles this message. So you can pass me any PID as argument, as long as the PID of that process know how to handle this message. Okay? Uh, modules, they are also polymorphic, right? We can pass modules around as atoms, and you can say, hey, you can, pass, you can give me any module as argument, as long as this module implements this function or those set of functions. This is exactly how the gen server, uh, the behaviors work, right? Gen server, supervisor. What we do is that we call the gen server module, passing our module as argument, and we 
and the implementation doesn't, doesn't really care how many functions it exports. It doesn't care about the module name, right? It just cares, like, do you implement this contract, right? Do, are you implementing those functions? So we can say, hey, give me any module as long as this module exports this function. However, when it comes to data types, we don't have that, right? There is no, there isn't. We can, I cannot even talk about it, right? Because there isn't anything. I cannot say, hey, you can pass this argument any data type that does this thing, okay? And, and that's one of the issues we, we try to solve. So in order to, to show why this is a problem, okay, um, and how this limits us developers, I want to, I like to give, use serialization as, a, as an example. So here I picked JSON serialization, okay? So we wrote this Erlang code, uh, we need to serialize, we need to encode stuff to JSON. So in this code, what we did is that we defined the JSON module, and then we are going to define a bunch of clauses, right? We say, hey, uh, if I want to encode this item to JSON, and this item is a list, here's the code that's going to do the encoding. If I want to encode this item, and it's a binary uh, to JSON, here is the code. Okay, and we are going to define a bunch of clauses, right? And we're going to probably handle the major data types that comes with OTP, and we are going to encode all of, all of them. And then we are going to ship this library, right? We're going to put it on GitHub. And, uh, and it's going to be there. What is going to happen in the future is, let's imagine that this library becomes very, very popular. A lot of people start using it. And in the future, what is going to happen is that uh, Robert, he's working on the Lua Row project, as an example, OK? And he says, oh, I want to add JSON encoding uh, support to this Lua Row project. The issue is that the Lua Row project uses a special dictionary implementation, okay, to power the Lua objects. And the JSON library doesn't know anything about this special dictionary implementation, okay? So the only option Robert really has at this point is say, okay, I'm going to fork the JSON library because I really want to use it. I'm going to go to that code we just saw and add a new clause so it works with my code, okay? And then somewhere else, we have the same thing. Joe is working on Oro2. And then he says, hey, I want to add JSON encoding support. And then he has his new data types that the JSON library does not know anything about. So what Oro is going to do? He's going to fork it. And he's going to, to uh, go on his fork and change that code to work with uh, those different data types. And what is the problem here? Right? The problem here is that it doesn't really compose. If I'm working on a project that needs, uh, that uses Lua Row and Row 2, I need to pick a fork, right? And picking a fork means that if I choose Robert's fork, Joe's library is not going to work as, expect as expected. And if I choose the other one, the other one's going to be broken, right? So I probably need to create a third fork, right, that has the changes from both of them. So it doesn't work, basically. It doesn't compose. And the issue is because we are adding all the clauses, right, to the module, right? We are trying to embed all this knowledge about all those data types into a single place. And this is not correct because the data type No, so uh, that's a very good point, Costas. Uh, so why would they fork it? They could just add one special clause that handles it before calling the other code. The problem with JSON, that's why I like to use serialization as an example, is that you can have uh, their data types with a list inside, with their data types inside, with some other data type inside, right? You can get the data, the, the structures that you want to serialize, they can be nested in arbitrary ways. Right, so you cannot have like I just want to call it before. What the? Um, so, are you suggesting that we need to call them? The, they would call a particular module in their code beforehand. Yeah. Okay, so let's let's entertain this idea. Okay, so we're going to do. Uh, wait, I need to mirror this. Let's have a. I need to count this. We have three minutes. I have three minutes to convince you, costs. Okay? <laughs> so otherwise, I will be out of time. So they're going to say my encode. Okay? And they're going to say... Uh, yeah, so they're going to say they have a special item, and let's say it's a record that it's, it's a S dict, the special dict. And here, they're going to say... 
um, okay, this is how I'm going to encode my SDICT, right? But let's imagine that this SDICT, I'm going to use the map infrastructure representation here, it's a key value, okay, just to represent. But this value here could be a list. Right, so I'm going to encode the key. Yes, okay, perfect. Uh, even if I do that, my value can have a list. And who knows how to convert the list? It's not my code, it's the original code. So unless I teach my code now how to convert both list and the other one, Right? I will end up, I'll need to implement half of the library here because the data types that can merge in arbitrary ways. Right? I can even have my dictionary containing, a ro the, Joe, for example, he can have his dictionary containing one of Robert's dictionary as a value. So you cannot, you need to be able to go back and forth. Right? Uh, we, can, we can go back into this, like explicitly, uh, into this example. But the idea is that, so it needs to be recursive, right? I need to be able to, I need to say like, hey, now I'm encoding this, and then the value can have a list that is written in this library, and then inside the list we can have the dictionary that is in Robert's library, so there is no single point of entry. I would need, for example, this JSON library to call other modules, uh, be able to dispatch to different places rec recursively. And that's what we are doing, right? Uh, that's what we need to do, and that's what we do in Elixir. The data type, instead of asking one single place, right, like, hey, how do you know how to convert itself to JSON, or having a single entry point, what we need to do is that we need to uh, define, a, define a place to say, like, hey, if, if you can encode, you have the data structures, if you can encode uh, yourself to JSON, right? You just need to implement this protocol. So this is some Elixir code, right? The way we solve this is that we added this idea of protocols. And what a protocol does is that it says, you know, I'm, if, you want, if you implement the JSON protocol, all you need to do is to implement this encode function. And, what the, enco and the encode function you can call as any other function in your code. So this is how we call any other function in the, in the Elixir code. And now all we do is that we implement this protocol for all the data types that we know. So we say, hey, the implementation of JSON uh, for lists is this, right? The implementation of JSON for bit string is this other thing. And the implementation of JSON for number is this other thing. So what Robert can do is that in his library now, all we need to do is he doesn't need to change the original code because the original code defines only the contract and the dispatching logic based on the type. So all he needs to do is that he would go to his code and say, hey, the implementation of JSON for this particular type that I have defined in my library is this. And now the code can recursively right, dispatch to the proper place and do the conversion. And this is... This is just one example of protocols, right? So uh, what it means is that I can write a JSON library that is extensible to any data type because I'm defining a contract. We are applying the same idea we have in Erlang for processes, right? We can do I.O. with any process. We can define, you can define any I.O. device as long as you uh, respect some message contract. Here you can say, hey, you can give me any data type as argument as long as this data type defines this protocol. So we have answered this question, right? You can give me any data type as argument as long as it implement this protocol that has this particular contract. So here are some other examples of protocols. So in Elixir, we have the numeral protocol. And what the numeral protocol does is that it's able to, it defines all those collection functions like map, filter, reduce, and it can work with a huge variety of data types as long as the data type implements the neural protocol. So here's how we can map a list, okay? Or we can use the same code to map a range, and so on. The nice thing about the neural protocol is that it's based on something called Haskell iterates. And what it means is that it works not only uh, with in-memory collections like lists, sets, ranges, but it can also abstract how we interact with resources. So here's how you you can, for example, get the first five lines of a file with Elixir. All you do is that you create a file stream giving the path. And we saw the stream, we get the idea before that the streams are lazy, right? So what we are doing is that we are creating a file stream and then we pass it to a numtake to take the first five entries. And when we call a numtake, what that's going to do is, is that it's going to open a file, right? Um, 
iterate the file, getting the first five lines, and then close it at the end. And everything is encapsulated here because the newer protocol knows how to work with collections, be them in memory or resources like I.O. or events coming to your system, and so on. Another protocol that we have in Elixir is the inspect protocol. So uh, if you call dict from list in Erlang, right, you're on the, on the shell, we get this as a result. Right, we get all this representation. We are not really supposed about to know about this, right? This representation is actually opaque, but um, the the terminal is going to show all of its contents unless you teach it in particular how should we render this thing, render this thing as a record. And again, it's the same issue, right? Why this is happening is because we have one central place that is doing the the the, the term printing. What we should do is that we should ask the data type, like, hey, we, we need to print you to a, a developer, right? How, what is the best way to print you to a developer that's working on the terminal right now? And in Elixir, is the inspect protocol. So we have a hash dict, which is an equivalent to the, er, to, the, sorry, to the Erlang dict. And when you create one in Elixir terminal, you get just the parts that matter. And if you, re if you need to pick inside, you can give an option and say, like, hey, show me everything as they are internally. But Mostly, you want to have just this. OK, so that was the first part about extensibility. And, uh, and it was basically about having protocols, right, and being able to, to express uh, polymorphism at the data type level, right? Now I can say, hey, you can give me anything, any data type, as long as it implements this particular protocol. And you're going to come back to this a little bit more later. Uh, there is also a point about uh, the second goal of the language, productivity. I'm not going to go long into this because um, it can be a long topic, but, and, we, and we heard about it in the keynote, right? One of the big points about productivity, it's kind of hard to argue which language is more productive than uh, the others. But uh, one thing that we cannot argue about is that having a very good tooling makes us productive. And in Elixir, we have this combination, for example, of Mix, which is our build tool, build tool the Hacks Package Manager, and having very easy to read and write documentation. So with those five lines, after, after you install Elixir, with those five lines, you create a new project, you compile and run its tests, you publish its package, and you generate the documentation for the package and put it online for everyone to consume and access. Okay, uh, We can talk more about this later. I want to go to the more interesting part of the talk, uh, which is about compatibility, which is the third goal. So um, to talk about compatibility, it's really interesting because at the beginning when we added this goal, uh, we were um, Exploring, so the first Elixir design, the first version of the language, when they were not even launched, right? it really sucked because I was really exploring, trying to push the buttons of the runtime and of the virtual machine and try to, to see how far I could go. And I, even, I was able to break some stuff, like uh, hot code swapping was not working properly because I was trying to fiddle uh, a lot with the bytecode that was generated. So at some point, I realized, like, hey, this is obviously not going to work. So that's when compatibility came as a goal that um, if I am writing this language to run on the Erlang virtual machine, because of the Erlang virtual machine, it doesn't make sense to break the features that the virtual machine offers. Right? Uh, and that's how compatibility came. And it was a really big thing for uh, a good while. So for example, if you came to Elixir and you wanted to define a supervisor, or you wanted to define a gen server, you would say, hey, Go, uh, go read the Erlang documentation and use the Erlang module and create your own gen server and create your own supervisor. And it took a while for us to, to feel confident enough to say, OK, uh, we have this foundation, but there are places where we can do better and we'll try to, to do better. And this is uh, the point about compatibility, which is interesting, because in the past it was like, we have this uh, compatibility and we respect it. But now we, are, we have this compatibility and we respect it, but we also want to embrace it and extend it. And that's why there are things like, so for example, uh, calling Elixir from Erlang and vice versa, there is, no performance, there is no performance cost, there is no bridging cost whatsoever. So, and, uh, and what this means right now uh, for Elixir 1.0 is that we are starting to say, hey, how can we see things that we have in OTP, like the behaviors, a little bit differently and how we can think about those things. So I want to talk about two things uh, for this part of the talk. The first one is Agent Server, which is, in my opinion, is a very su successful example of 
when we got um, something that was in OTP and extended it a little bit. And the other one is something that we are planning, which is called Gen Router. So the Gen Server, if I'm going to talk about Gen Server, uh, it's really, it, it's a very honest name, right? Because it's really a generic server. So we have a Gen Server, it's, uh, it, can be a, it can be about computation, just performing computation periodically. It could be about keeping some state. And many times it's a mixture of, of both, right? You have some state and you have some computation, some work you're doing that state. So it's really generic. The problem with that is that there are some times where we create a gen server only to keep state, for example. And it's hard because I'm going to, to, to look at some code and then I have all those callbacks and I need to take uh, some, uh, some time to look at the code, look at the callback and say, oh wait, I know this, this is just keeping state, it's not doing anything special. And the same happens with computation, right? Sometimes you just want to, to do something, and then you need to have the overhead of defining init, sending yourself a message so you can start processing something on handle info, for example. So what we did in Alexa is that we introduced two new things, uh, which are called tasks. So if if all you want to do is to create another process to execute some computation, you can use a task for that. And if all you want to do is to um, create a process, a gen server that's going to keep state, you can use an agent. And, um, and the way it works, so let me talk a little bit about those two abstractions. So tasks, for those familiar with Erlang internals, uh, it's very familiar with Proclib spawning. You just spawn a process, and we're going to take care to do everything that OTP requires, like setting the proper, the proper dictionary variables and so on. Okay, and that's how it started. It was just a start link and it would run some code. Okay, and when, if it crashed, it would log something useful, useful and so on. Um, but with time, we started to notice more interesting patterns that fits this. So for example, uh, async await. So a lot of times what we are doing is that we are spawning on process to perform some computation. Right? And then at the performance of computation, you want it to send a message back to you and you're going to read it back. It's a very easy way to do concurrency. So this pattern is very common, right? To spawn something, uh, have it send a message back, and then you receive it. So we said, okay, we already have tasks which are about computation. So what if we steal a little bit from C sharp and just add two functions called task async that is going to uh, spawn this task to perform some computation and then I can do whatever I want and when I'm ready to read the result, I'm just going to call task await. Okay, so that's also there. Something that is also became easy with tasks is because um, because they are only about computation, we can assume some particular, uh, some of the supervision strategies don't really make sense for them. So what we do is that we ship with a task supervisor that makes it really easy for you to do distributed tasks. So all you need to set up a distributed task with Elixir is that you start a supervisor, probably in the supervision tree of your application, right? give it a name. And then if I want to do some async computation on another node, I just call the task supervisor async, passing the node of the supervisor right, that is going to supervise the task and the, function, and the function I want to use to compute that. So this is an example where we were able to say, like, hey, what if we specialize this just a little bit? And it grew with time, and uh, we added some conveniences that are really useful uh, for everyday development. Okay? And similarly, we did the same with agents. So if tasks is about computation, thank you. Uh, if tasks is about computation, agents is about state. So if I, have, if I need a process that its own responsibility is to keep state, I can just create an agent. And that's really all we need to do, right? We need to uh, create an agent passing a function that's going to give the initial state. And then we are going to, every time we want to update the agent, we just call agent with an increment function. And then uh, if we need to read the state or part of the state, I just call agent.get, and I'm going to read it. So this was really nice because after we added those abstractions, even going for Elixir code base, there were uh, different places where it was only about computation and on or only about state, and we could clean up the code uh, quite considerably. So this is a nice improvement, but I think the main benefit uh, that we get about adding the specialized stuff is, for example, when it comes to agent, we can start, we, we are kind of teaching developers, like, hey, you have this abstraction that is just about state and just about keeping state. So what if we take the next step? For, for example, there is a bunch of interesting research happening uh, with uh, LVARs, 
which is lattice-based data structures for determinist parallels, which is, since it, what if we could have a set of agents, okay, and operations that are guaranteed to be deterministic for parallelism. Because sometimes we have different processes executing something uh, towards a common state. And in Elixir, you're likely going to put that state in an agent. And what if we have a subset of agents that say all the operations you can do with the agent, they are going to guarantee that the result of all those computations is going to uh, be deterministic, OK? So this is one way. So this is not in Elixir. Everything I said so far was in Elixir. This is not. But it's one of the ways we are uh, researching how we can use these state-based properties to assert, uh, use these state-based agents to assert more interesting properties. Another example of that that's familiar to a bunch of early developers is, OK, so what if we have a set, get some of the CRDTs research, and have a set of agents that are guaranteed to be replica replicable across nodes? Because they're only about state anyway, right? So if you're guaranteeing some property about this state, we can have that, right? So this is one of the things we're exploring. Uh, and and besides that, we are also exploring other things related to parallelism, right? So if we are thinking, hey, I have an agent state here that I want to have deterministic parallelism, it means I want to have a bunch of processes computing, uh, usually towards some common goal, OK? So what if we could explore this even further? And that's the last part of the talks, when we talk about parallelism. So before we get to parallelism, I want to talk, uh, there are three bullets here. I want to first talk about laziness, and then I'm going to pipeline parallelism. And then I'm going to briefly mention da data parallelism because I'm almost running out of time. So at the beginning of the talk, I said, hey, Java 8 has this idea of collections. And uh, later I said that in Elixir we have this thing called protocols that adds the idea of collections with the null module. So here I have that, that Java code kind of translated, right? So I have my widgets, I can filter them, I can map them, and in this case I'm taking five. And uh, this is eager, right? So it has the, the same issue with that Java code where if I have a large widgets list, for example, when I filter it, I'm going to traverse it one time, then when I map, I'm going to traverse it again, and then I take five. So in Elixir, we have this idea of collections, but we also have the ideas of laziness. And all we need to do to have laziness is to replace the enum module here by stream, OK? So all we did is that we replace the module that we are calling, and the stream has uh, almost all the functions in enum, but implemented in a lazy way. So I can say widgets, and then I want to call a stream filter. This is not going to traverse the widgets, right? It's just going to store the computation. When you call map, the same thing. It's not going to traverse them. It's just going to store this computation. And then at the end, when you actually need the result or you need to sum, you call enum, for example, to get a list, right? And this starts to give a bunch of interesting properties because now, uh, since this is lazy, we can even work with events coming from other places or even infinite collections, right? Because we are never eagerly evaluating the whole thing. We are evaluating items as they come. And along the same line, what we can do is that if we are already at each step here, at filter, map, and take, if we are already storing the computation, right? Maybe we could get this computation and execute in different processes, right? As a way to start exploring parallelism. Because, you know, we are already storing them anyway. We're already collecting. So what is going to change if I decide to execute that somewhere else? So, for example, what we could do in this code is that um, I could add a little bit of pipeline parallelism by doing just one line change, right? So this is the code we had before, OK? But now uh, I can have a little bit of pipeline parallelism by simply adding this function call here. And what this is doing when you say stream.async, what this is going to do is say, you know all the computation I have so far. What I wanted to do is that I wanted to compute this in another process, and it's going to send the results to the current process I'm on. And if I call this multiple times, right, if I have a huge uh, data uh, pipeline of uh, of computations that I am processing, mapping, filtering, taking, whatever, flat map, and so on. If I call with stream async multiple times, what I could do is that I'm going to create a bunch of intermediary processes where the data flows through them. So if I have this, where I call it uh, three times, you're going to have something like this, right? I have the input. And as soon as I have the first uh, data coming, right, be it from a list, be it from a file, or 
uh, whatever, as soon as I have the first data, right, it's going to go to the first process. And then the first process is going to perform the computations that make sense to it, and then it's going to forward to the next process. And then the next process is going to receive this first event, starting computing things in it, and the process before is going to get the new event, and they are all computing on this data at the same time, right? And we are looking at this thing and saying, okay, so uh, we are thinking now about having all those processes that are receiving data and computing stuff on the data, okay? Um, is there a good pattern to, to do this in, in OTP? And uh, if, you, if you saw this talk uh, at San Francisco, there the answer was gen event, but we are working further on that and we say like, wait, wait, gen event's not going to work as uh, we expect. So right now we are considering a new behavior which is called gen router, which is similar to gen event. The difference is that the gen event, you have the event manager and the handler and they are all in the same process. And with the gen router, we want to have all the handlers in different processes. And this is also going to give us the ability to choose to whom we should route uh, some particular event. Okay, so uh, what do we mean with the gen router? We want to have a new behavior that specifies the message format for connecting different processes. So as long as I'm sending those events, obeying a particular format, all those processes, they are going to be able to communicate with each other. And it's going to effectively replace gen event because uh, it's similar to gen event, but it has one process per handler, which actually increases parallelism to and concurrency inside the gen event handlers themselves while allowing custom dispatch rules, okay? So I'm going to skip this part. But the idea with the router, router is that uh, we could do something like a broadcast, which is what a gen event does. So every event that comes, so we have three events here, one, two, and three. We could broadcast them to all processes. But if you want, you can write a, call, uh, a callback for this behavior that customizes, hey, I want to send the events in a round robin fashion, right? Or I could have a custom sharding rule that's going to send to particular nodes based on the event itself. Or even random, right? Whatever. When the data comes, I'm going to send uh, to whatever chosen at random. And uh, with this, right, we, are st we started thinking like, hey, I know I have those processes, right? And I have all those computations. And I know how those processes communicate to each other. And this is bringing us... Uh, what I said, a pipeline parallelism. I have those, is, those stages, right, that perform something and the data is going through. But sometimes uh, moving data is expensive, even more in Erlang, right? Like every time we send data between processes, uh, it's going to be cop copied unless it's a large binary. So uh, since we have already all that specified, we can consider taking even further, which is adding also functions that are related to data parallelism. And we have a bunch of interesting talks regarding that on this event itself, right? Algorithm skeletons and how we can have those computations and try to spread it to different places, sometimes to CPU or something GPU based and so on. So that's the area that we are uh, working on actively right now and trying to find the proper abstractions so we could build more on top of parallelism, make parallelism easier, right? Because the point is, we have this uh, great virtual machine, we have this great runtime, right, uh, with all those abstractions that we we're talking about, the data types, the modules, the processes. But when it comes, if I have some chunk of data, and then I want to process this data, right, um, using different processes, it's actually today, it's easier to do in, if all I want is to process that quickly, it's easy to do in Java 8 than to do in Erlang or Elixir. Okay, because they already have the abstractions, right? They have the laziness, and then at the end of their laziness stack, they can say, like, run parallel, right? And you can choose different strategies to run that in parallel, right? They don't have a lot of the guarantees we have here regarding building a robust system, right? They don't have all the framework about thinking what is going to happen if something goes wrong. But if I am a developer and I have a problem and I want to get started quickly and solve that particular problem, they are going to beat us. Right, because it's much easier to write there. Everything's already, uh, they have a bunch of tutorials, everything's already in place. They're going to write the code. They're going to say, hey, this is using my, my, all my cars, I am happy. So, uh, so I think we have a great VM and a great runtime, and we can provide better tools than we see uh, elsewhere, right, because of it. But we need to work for it. And, uh, the, and the benefit of it all is that right now I'm talking about concurrency, but because 
different uh, Erlang nodes, we have distributed Erlang and having different uh, nodes talking to each other is fairly easy. It should not be hard to get this set up uh, to something distributed, right? Which could be a win on the long term when we compare to the other frameworks out there. So um, I want to finish the talk by saying that there are many interesting challenges here. And um, if you have feedback, I would love to hear them. So I was talking about protocols at the beginning, right? But what is the most efficient way, really, of doing polymorphic dispatch, OK? Or um, a bunch of languages they use inline caches to optimize polymorphic dispatch. And how can we have this here uh, in Erlang? Or, if we're going to, to do pipeline parallelism, how can we provide back pressure efficiently? Because if you have a pipeline parallelism, one of the issues we have with that is that one stage is necessarily going to be the, slower, the slowest of all of them. Right? So how that stage can give back pressure to everything before and say, hey, slow down. Right? You're giving me items too fast, but while keeping everything efficiently. Or if you are, and there's a bunch of research on this last topic in particular, right? If you're going to choose data parallelism, what, what are the the algorithms that are really important for us and that we can uh, leverage efficiently uh, with Elixir and Erlang. So if you like the talk and if you're interested in Elixir, go check our website. We have a getting started guide. We have uh, installation instructions there. We have a page with a bunch of uh, learning resources. I think these slides are outdated. All those books, they already came out. They're already published. I need to update it. And I want to finally just thank my company, Platform Attack, for all, uh, investing on me and investing on Elixir and you know, guaranteeing that I can do all this work and uh, research in some way. And that's it. So um, thank you very much. This was the talk about Elixir. Thank you. And we have three minutes for questions. OK. Okay. Yep. How does it know how to dispatch to it? Okay. Okay, so that's a very good question. The question is, um, you can see this, yes. So we had the, that Elixir code, right, that defines the JSON protocol. And as you said, we are obviously going to have something like encode and then an item. And when we are going to, inside there, we're going to have code like this. Okay, how we are going to encode in this item as a list. So when we define a protocol internally, we are defining this clause, we are defining this clause, and we are defining um, some, all, the other, all the clauses for the Erlang data types. Okay, and then there's the question, if Joe's define his own type, right, it's not, we're not even going to have a guard for it, okay, how we, we know how to dispatch to it. And that's where the custom data type, it comes in. Okay, so this solution is heavily based on how they solve this exactly same problem in Clojure. And uh, in Elixir, we have maps, right, so uh, as we have in Erlang. And if the map has a special field called underscore struct, it's giving it a tag, and I can uh, dispatch it based on the tag. So if you have a custom type in Elixir, uh, so here is an Elixir map, for example, foo bar. Okay. Uh, if I have a custom um, data structure in Elixir, it's going to have a field here that says, hey, this is a struct of type Joe's data type. And based on the tagging of the map, I'm going to, I know how to dispatch to the proper implementation. So we have custom data types, and those custom data types are tagged. And based on this tag, I, have, I know exactly to which implementation I should dispatch to, because they have this name. Very good question. Thank you. Um, Thank you. We, yes. don't, uh, we ran out of time. Sorry. If you want to ask questions, just yeah. do it after. Just come. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is about full base programming. And, and um, I've started, so to be honest, I started to read one book. The book was not good, and I gave up in the middle, and I haven't come back to it. So uh, the answer is no. Uh, you're not the first one to say, like, hey, look at uh, flow, ba flow base programming. 
and I'll try to put more attention to it and see if there are uh, which are the ideas there could be relevant here. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.